Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's segment of Green Chat. I am Stephanie Gluchacki, President of Clinical Operations for CB2 Insights. As many of you know, uh, you're tuning in today to hear us talk about a, a rather sensitive subject, a subject that we feel is very important and a subject that we feel definitely warrants further conversations, hopefully leading to a greater research initiative. Uh, that is surrounding the, the issue of cannabis and COVID. Of course, right now, everyone in the world, particularly here in the United States, is being impacted by COVID in some way, shape or form, whether it be um, that you've contracted uh, the virus, whether a family member has, whether you've been impacted uh, through job loss, any number of reasons that you may be impacted. It's, it's definitely touching everyone in some way, shape or form. As you look through social media, as we turn on our television, there are many places or many, many organizations touting that uh, cannabis or CBD is a cure-all for the COVID, the COVID virus. So we want to talk today very openly about really what, what, the conversation is surrounding this topic. And of course, I wanna open up very specifically by, by really making our legal folks happy and, and really clarifying right at the onset, we are not here today to make any kind of medical claim where cannabis uh, specifically for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is concerned. That is not at all what we're here to do today. We've brought on some professionals. We've brought on members of our team who specialize in various aspects of what we'll be talking about today um, to really just provoke some discussion surrounding this topic. So I'm gonna briefly introduce who we have joining us here today. So of course we have uh, Nicole Dennis, who is a nurse practitioner in our Maryland clinics. Nicole, please say hello to your audience. Hi, we have, hi Nicole, thanks for joining us today. We have Alicia Garibaldi, who is our clinical research manager at CB2 Insights. Of course, CB2 Insights being the parent company to Canacare Docs. Alicia, say hello. Hi, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's it's okay. Already. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie Fover, of course, is our area manager for our Maryland and Virginia offices. Mar Ma Maggie has, uh, that seems such a simplified way of saying, Maggie's been with us forever and just houses so much information uh, in the industry. She's definitely someone that I lean on for expertise within the industry. She's had many conversations at the legislative level. Um, just absolutely and definitely so thankful to have Maggie joining us here today. And we will be joined um, via video later on in this segment by uh, Melissa Martell, our nurse practitioner in Maine. So, um, Let's open it up with, with the conversation. And Alicia, I think I'm gonna lean on you for this research. We at CB2 Insights, of course, we put out some surveys and those of you who may be watching as a result of an invitation to the show were invited to participate in that survey. So Alicia, do you mind speaking on some of the interesting uh, data that came out of that survey? Yeah, absolutely. So back in March when the pandemic was declared and it was really starting to impact everyday life, we launched a survey. Um, it was optional to fill out. It was really just to gain some interesting insights into people's lives during the pandemic, trying to understand how it was impacting them and how it was impacting their cannabis use for those cannabis users who completed the survey. So fast forward to now in the middle of August, the pandemic is still very much impacting lives all across the country. And what we did is we decided to take a look at responses from early in the pandemic to those later in the pandemic. So I used the target date or the date of July 15th to kind of cut off. So responses from prior to July 15th and those after July 15th, okay. oh, like the first and second half of the pandemic for when there was a slight dip in cases there. And I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things that we found from the survey. Again, this was really just, it was kind of for fun to get some interesting insights into, um, into some things, but, Interestingly enough, um, more people rated their health as excellent or very good later on in the pandemic. So 49% of people more recently have rated their health as being excellent or very good compared to only 41% earlier on. More interesting to that even is that 69% of people reported not being sick in the last three months compared to 55% of those earlier on. So those who, compare, who completed the survey earlier on in the pandemic actually reported to being sick in the last three months more often than those who completed it more recently, which 
leads to some interesting discussion. It could just be because those responding early, we were just coming out of the winter months and they were just experiencing more common colds, or it could just really be showing that in terms of common colds, some of this distancing is helping the extra precautions, the hand washing, the hand sanitizer, and that's actually leading to, as it relates to minor illnesses, not looking at COVID-19, but that actually may be impacting other illnesses. Okay just as a, as a discussion point there. Um, we of course saw later on in the reporting for people who have responded to the survey more recently that 9% reported having being exposed to COVID compared to only 4% of those earlier on, which just goes along with the trends of it being far more prevalent now. And the incidence is much, much higher. Um, to go through just a few more, um, it, in the second half of reporting, so again, since July 15th, more people believed that they may be less likely to get sick as a result of using cannabis. And addition to that, more people believed that they may actually be less likely to contract COVID-19 as a result of using cannabis, which I think really plays into this discussion today as so many of these companies are putting out information saying falsely that, or not even necessarily falsely, but just grounded in no evidence that right cannabis or CBD or THC may actually impact their um, susceptibility to COVID-19 or actually may help as a treatment. So it is interesting to see that in the second half, this information seems to be getting to people and people may actually be believing it and they may be thinking that they're using cannabis could have an impact on whether or not they're going to contract COVID-19. Finally, just in terms of individuals actually obtaining cannabis, the proportion of people reporting the cannabis was more difficult to purchase went down. So earlier on in the pandemic, people were reporting that cannabis was difficult to access. It was difficult to purchase. But I think that just having measures put in place that there's more curbside pickups and delivery options available through many parts of the country, this has gone down significantly and people aren't reporting difficulty accessing cannabis as much as they were on earlier on in the pandemic. Finally, um, a lot more people are reporting using more cannabis now in the second half as compared to the first half that that's gone up. Just as a direct result of the pandemic, people are saying they're using more than they were prior to the pandemic. I feel like that was a lot of information. That, yeah, we'll, we'll touch upon a lot of those those things throughout this segment as we'll, we'll speak a little bit about cannabis and how potential conversations relate to uh, prompting further research. And Alicia, certainly, thank you very much. Your your role is so incredible. Um, because again, the, at the federal level, there, there's not a lot of research. Alicia was very gracious in providing me with um, some publications. And admittedly, there there's not a lot where cannabis and COVID are concerned. So there's definitely opportunity and room to further uh, the research opportunity for, for this particular topic. So Alicia, thank you for gathering that information and sharing. And feel free to jump in at any time when um, something might really trigger a, a data response or you have so, some further information. I'd like to turn it over to Maggie now. It's 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 really helpful to kind of have the, the basic understanding of, of cannabis as medicine and how the body interacts with cannabis, specifically talking about the endocannabinoid system. So Maggie, I'd love if you would just jump in there and um, maybe help our viewers a little more understand or better understand the endocannabinoid system and how these conversations play into that. Absolutely. So it would be really hard to have a conversation about how uh, COVID might be affected by cannabis uh, use without really understanding the endocannabinoid system, because that's where it really all functions correctly in the body. So this system is a system of receptors throughout your body that is kind of like a lock and a key mechanism where the receptor is like a lock and cannabinoids are like a key. So the cannabinoids, when they enter the lock, then they're able to open that mechanism. And through this, it um, results in the cellular wall being opened in these receptors, which permits a lot of different um, neurotransmitters to travel through them. So it's a very intricate system. Um, but basically, the reason the entire system exists is to promote homeostasis 
which is just a fancy word for balance throughout our bodies. So when a level might not be ideal, the endocannabinoid system is able to correct that imbalance. Um, the receptors that are uh, most prevalent throughout the brain um, and the neuro is the CB1 receptors. And then we also have CB2 receptors. These receptors are found in abundance located in our immune system. So I would theorize that there would be a lot of studies and information really specific to the CB2 receptors when it comes to how cannabis and COVID react with each other. Um, but there, um, a lot of the symptoms would be addressed more through the CB1 receptors. So they're both going to be very in play and very essential to really understanding how COVID is um, reacting in our bodies with cannabis. Uh, so I look forward to a lot more information about that. Um, but that's kind of just in general what this endocannabinoid system is that we're speaking of. That That's great, Maggie. Thank you for kind of putting that out in layman's terms. It's, it's, it's really just that lock and key system. It's really just a true, true simplified way to help understand the achievement of the homeostasis. So uh, we certainly have our practitioners go through extensive training to be able to speak on this topic and really help patients understand as they're trying to achieve their healthcare goals. Um, they, they understand these different mechanisms and it looks like, okay, we, we do have Nicole. I thought we lost her for a moment there. I, I do want to turn it over and um, lean on Nicole, who is, of course, our nurse practitioner, and really just listen to um, what she has to say and, and her opinions on the subject. So, Nicole, please go right ahead. Hi, I'm so sorry. I'm having connection issues. So no I'm going to try to just um, pinpoint some of the main things I wanted to address. Um, so as we talk about COVID and cannabis, it is important for us to know that patients that have um, coronavirus or COVID-19, that they are having, they will have more of an increased risk of respiratory conditions and smoking or vaping can complicate those respiratory illnesses. So it's advised that if a patient does have coronavirus or any type of respiratory um, conditions or distress that they should use their alternative modes of administration when it comes to cannabis. Um, there has, of course, as you mentioned, been talks about in the anti-inflammatory processes, whether or not that can... Um, oh, we may be losing Nicole here. Let's give her another second to, to regroup from a technical standpoint. I suspect she was uh, going to start talking about the anti-inflammatory properties that are inherent. I did hear that word come up. <laughs> Nicole, do we have you back? Okay, we apologize for some small technical difficulties here. We'll just give Nicole a moment to, to jump back in. Um, I, I do want to touch back on on the anti-inflammatory properties. I, I do know, um, and Alicia, please, if you may, there is some research that on on the research that you had sent, we we saw a lot about the cytokine storm. Do you have anything specific to address where that that is concerned? Until we get Nicole back, if unless we do have Nicole back, yes. Nicole, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm so sorry. It's continuing to. No drop. worries, no worries. Um, Alicia, sorry. Alicia, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry. I heard <laughs> Nicole, great. I heard... please go ahead. Yes. So it seemed like you were telling us about the anti-inflammatory. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I, I got the point home that, you know, smoking, can you, I'm sorry. That, um, the concern for smoking, Nicole, is that what you were going to, to talk about? Perhaps as adding to conditions I think, we, I think we lost her again. Okay, apologies for that. There are some technical difficulties there. Uh, we'll certainly bring Nicole back in. Um, actually, Eric, um, in the background there, perhaps you could introduce uh, Melissa's video. Um, if you'll stand by, we have a video from our other nurse practitioner who might um, 
be able to shed some light on the topic that Nicole was going to address. Hi, my name is Melissa Martell and I'm a family nurse practitioner working in the Bangor, Maine office. I have worked for CanonCare.ops for a few years and I'm joining you guys today during Green Chat to talk a little bit about something that we haven't talked about yet and that Hi, my name is Melissa Martell and I'm a family nurse practitioner working in the Bangor, Maine office. I have worked for CanonCare.ops for a few years and I'm joining you guys today during Green Chat to talk a little bit about something that we haven't talked about yet and that is cannabis and COVID. So cannabis has been around for quite a while. Let's talk about that. It started out in 1985 being approved by the FDA for use in chemo-induced nausea. And then in 1992, it was approved by the FDA for use in wasting syndromes, such as patients that um, have AIDS, things like that. And then in 2018, it was recently approved for the use of epilepsy in children. So there's a discussion of is it useful for COVID, is it not? Basically because COVID is so new and we don't know a lot about it and research and clinical studies take quite a few years to be conducted. There's just not enough studies yet to prove whether it is helpful or not. However, from studies and research that has been conducted in the past when looking at viruses that mimic COVID, we know one thing that occurs. And this is that there's a cytokine storm that results in the body. So it's a hyperinflammation. So when we're looking at what we have for research with the cannabinoids, this creates a downplay in the cytokine storm. So in theory, we need more studies to be conducted, but cannabis could play a role in reducing this inflammatory effect. So let's talk about what else it could help with. It can also help with anxiety, depression, chronic pain, any other things that you're feeling during this COVID time, because everybody is being affected by it, whether it's you, your spouse, your children, or anybody else. So look into what cannabis could do for you. Meet with one of our providers, like myself. Let me do an assessment. Let's talk about it and talk about getting a certification. That's great. And thank you to Melissa. Melissa could not join us live today. She is seeing patients out of our Bangor Maine clinic. So again, thank you very much, Melissa, for that information. Uh, looks like we did not have the ability to have Nicole join us back. So Alicia, I wanted to give you the opportunity to follow up on something that Melissa had touched upon with respect to this cytokine storm. And I believe that there's some, some research that alludes to that conversation. Do you mind speaking on that topic? Absolutely. So yeah, as the research stands, so peer reviewed articles that have been published to date, which a lot of them have come out, um, we're in a bit of a bit of an infodemic, there's information being distributed faster than anybody can consume all of the information. But one of the key topics that's being discussed frequently in these articles as it relates to cannabis and COVID is this cytokine storm. And essentially this hypothesis that cannabinoids, so mainly CBD and THC can actually down regulate the cytokine production. And that's where the hypotheses are coming in that cannabis may act as a treatment for COVID-19. I cannot stress enough though in this situation that these are commentary discussion and hypothesis articles. There's nothing yet that has come out that is actually a clinical trial investigating this live. We have one basic science article that's been published it has not yet been peer reviewed. There are researchers, researchers in Alberta, Canada, who have started looking at different strains of cannabis as it relates to COVID-19 and really their effect that they have on the inflammatory response and immune responses in humans. But at this point, all it is is hypothesis. Nobody has actually yet come out and say, I'm going to investigate this in humans. And that's where we really need the research because I think that there is potential because there is there is theory behind why it may help but until we actually have trials we can't go proclaiming that cbd and thc and cannabis in general is going to be some sort of a miracle cure for covid right as melissa did touch on it can help with other um, facets of living through the pandemic in particular one stat that i found in the data that was extremely interesting were the amount of certifications for anxiety as the pandemic ramped up. 
Earlier on in March, we saw about 13% of all certifications coming in for anxiety. By April, this more than doubled. So by April, there were 28% of the certifications through Canicare Docs that were for anxiety as a primary condition. So you can just see as a result of this that individuals are seeking cannabis to help with this, not necessarily with COVID, but for other symptoms as a result of COVID and being in what one can only refer to as trying times during the pandemic, trying to trying to deal with isolation and quarantine and all of the changes that have happened to our lives as a result of it. But again, just to stress, there's no, there's not enough data at this point. There are some very strong hypotheses, but there's no research to back it at this point. And unfortunately, that's where we're seeing all of these companies getting um, written warnings from the FDA saying you cannot claim that cannabis or your products are going to have any impact on COVID-19, whether it be preventing or treating it. That's a great point to make. And again, as I opened the show, we you open social media, you, know, you turn on the television and there are there are people touting the, the benefits of cannabis and that it is a cure all. And while some people anecdotally might feel that that's that's supportive um, to your point, the research and the peer reviews are just not there yet. So certainly proceed with caution. We're help to we're here to help you navigate through these types of conversations. Our practitioners certainly are here to help you navigate through those conversations. And yes, it was very interesting to see that the FDA is is has been very, very astute and very quick to have the removal of those claims. So uh, Nicole, it looks like you're able to join us. I, I hope you you have a better, a better connection now because we'd love to hear more about what you started to say. I believe you were talking about cannabis, smoking, how that might exacerbate conditions of COVID-19. So please go on. Yes, thank you. I'm so sorry about that. So no I was just saying that patients that have any type of respiratory disease or chronic um, immune diseases where they're immunocompromised like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, they're more at risk for having complications related to COVID. So it is imperative that they understand that smoking and vaping can affect um, your immune response or your, your respiratory functionality when it comes to COVID. And so that the most ideal way of using cannabis, if you do have COVID-19, is to use a tincture, topical ointments, edibles, um, just something that's non-inhalation as a method. Okay, perhaps it, perhaps Nicole doesn't have the, the best connection yet still. Uh, Maggie, did you want to follow up with any comments based on Nicole's uh, suggestions? Yeah, definitely. It's it's great that we do have so many different products available to us for use while somebody's suffering with COVID. Because as Alicia was pointing out, there are, are so many different symptoms that cannabis is able to help us with that we are dealing with during COVID that might be entirely you know separate from COVID. Um, and so someone that is experiencing actually having the disease of COVID is having all of these other stressors that everyone has. And then on top of it, they've got, you know, the, this disease that we're all kind of worried about. And that alone is going to really increase anxiety in somebody as they don't really know how the disease is going to course through, throughout it. Um, some people have relatively, you know, mild progression of symptoms, while other people can get very serious very quickly. So I'm sure that's going to be on somebody's mind. So it's nice that they still do have, you know, other options for using their cannabis that they had been treating with previously. Right. Uh, anyway, at their disposal. And one of the best places to really get those products is make sure that you're getting laboratory tested medicine from a dispensary. Laboratory tested. Yes, that's absolutely mm -hmm. key. And here in Massachusetts, and I'm sure those of you watching from, from other states as well, your local dispensaries can certainly answer questions about specific products that might be available within their within their stores as well. Um, because it is important to Maggie and to Nicole's point that that we use caution when, when proceeding because of the fact that uh, we don't want to exacerbate any symptoms. We don't want to provoke any symptoms either. So Maggie, thank you for that. As part of this, I'd like to add, I, I, I know that 
COVID aside, it's important to just live a healthy lifestyle, ensure that you're staying hydrated, ensure that you're, you're eating a balanced diet, um, really just ensuring that you're getting the proper amounts of sleep. And just to touch upon something that Maggie had said, those who might be suffering from anxiety, that might uh, make it very difficult for, for you to sleep or for patients to sleep. So cannabis may be a way to address those particular symptoms um, and, and help a patient get the good night's sleep that they need in order to be able to uh, build up the immunity to combat a virus such as this. So again, overall and general health is very key and very important. And in, in a little bit later in the segment, we'll talk a little bit about how Canacure Docs, of course, powered by Skylight Health can help facilitate some of these conversations for you. Um, Maggie, other than, you know, we, we talked about staying healthy, staying safe. How are dispensaries in general helping helping patients to ensure that they're able to access their medicine during the pandemic? Yeah, so dispensaries, as, as I touched upon, are able to help by first ensuring that the medicine is safe. Um, you know, that's going to be your starting point for concern. Um, they're going to make sure that when the medicine is being handled, that people are wearing uh, face masks and gloves. They're going to make sure that your medicine isn't contaminated. So that's kind of the starting point. But then they're also putting in um, procedures to make sure that they're keeping patients safe at the point of purchase as well. So dispensaries that are allowing patients in, they are rigorously cleaning. They are making sure all surfaces are disinfected. They're making sure that their staff are wearing proper protective equipment. They're making sure that um, they're cleaning these surfaces regularly so that everyone stays safe. They're making sure that we're following proper social distancing, that people are remaining six feet apart. If there's too many people in the location, they're forming a line inside that's staying six feet apart. So that's how they're helping people in the physical location. But some of the other measures that have been put in place, I would theorize probably are helping even further. Um, these options that they're making available to people are things such as curbside delivery which where a patient would pull up in their car after placing an order online nice and securely, uh, then the representative would come out, they would make sure that they are a patient and collect their information, and they would go into the dispensary for them, get their medicine, that dispensary agent would then bring it out to the patient's car, nice and securely, again, wearing face masks. Um, one thing I'd like to encourage patients to do as well is to protect the dispensary employees by making sure that you're wearing face masks when you're in your car. Them, um, as a courtesy, because we are all trying to keep each other safe. Um, they're able to do that very seamlessly in a lot of locations. Um, there are some locations that have had the um, forethought to actually um, use old banking locations that even have actual drive through uh, tellers that they're able to use. Um, that's an extremely convenient way for them to do this curbside delivery thing. Um, other organizations are taking it one step further, and they're actually doing deliveries for patients. So patients at that point don't even need to leave their home. They can stay at home, they can place an order online, and they can expect a professional dispensary employee to arrive at their door at a predetermined time based on, you know, dispensary availability. Uh, again, that person would be following all proper procedures. They would make sure that they're wearing a face and gloves and that they in their hands after transactions. Um, dispensaries are also trying to do as many touchless options for women as possible. Um, merchant services are definitely an issue, but some uh, dispensaries have been able to figure that out and where they can do that is a nice option for really um, keeping everybody safe. So at the dispensary, they've done so many things to make it safer for patients. I would imagine that that's why um, there is an increased availability that patients are feeling in the survey about medical cannabis because these organizations really put a lot of thought into trying to figure out how to make this work best for their patients and how to keep their patients and their team members safe at the same time. Um, so excellent options available there. Um, we have definitely here docs done everything that we can to keep patients safe as well. Um, it's been very interesting and exceptional that most government agencies have declared cannabis as an essential um, function of daily life. We're really recognizing this for the important medicine that it is. So most states have allowed telemedicine to be utilized across the board in medicine, uh, most importantly for cannabis evaluation as well. 
some of our providers are able to still help the same patients that they were able to help uh, previously. It's as simple as being in front of your computer, just like you are right now, and just enabling your video and having a, a video conversation with your provider. Um, most people are finding telemedicine is very effective and they're really enjoying it. They're finding it very convenient, um, as seamless as possible, and technology mm -hmm. is cooperating, but we're all um, you know, dealing with that in our best ways throughout society. Um, so that's not um, anything specific to telemedicine, unfortunately. Um, but it really, really has made it very easy for patients to join the program if they're needing to because of experiencing increased anxiety because of the, the climate that we're in. Uh, so that's definitely another way that we've been able to really uh, see patients helped and staying well. And um, it's great to notice that the survey is really finding patients to feel as if they're in better health these days. Um, so I, I know the physicians at Canica are very happy to have played a part in that. Absolutely. Thank you, Maggie. That was quite thorough. And Carla, I saw that you had added a, a comment. So I, I certainly hope that addresses your, your question. We'll definitely go into a little bit more detail to help you actually understand how to go through that process. And Lily Rose, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that you're finding the, the segment very informative. We, we definitely appreciate that comment. So um, I, I do want to touch upon um, what Maggie has just talked about, and that's with telemedicine. So initially, not, not many states who offer medical cannabis to patients allowed for telemedicine. So it was actually very, very reassuring, as Maggie said, that um, states really rallied together and did what was necessary to keep medical cannabis patients in their state by offering and allowing for it in some cases on a temporary basis, telehealth to be able to achieve your medical cannabis certification. So with respect to Canacare docs, again, uh, we, we very quickly, because we did have uh, several states that we operated in prior to the pandemic, we did have states that allowed for telemedicine. So it was a very seamless transition for us because we already had our telemedicine platform in place. And it was really just a matter of, of adjusting the workflow specific to the, the new telemedicine states, if you will, and really flipping that switch to be able to quickly allow patients to be able to achieve their certification from the comfort safety of their own home, not having to, to leave their home. So that process, we, we went into this pandemic thinking in, in many cases it would be just, gosh, Maggie, a couple of weeks, I thought we'd, we'd be in this situation. Here we are many, many months later, and we've taken the opportunity to readdress our workflows, our, our processes, our protocols, or even our technology um, to continue to enhance upon the experience to ensure that uh, we can offer the most seamless and simple way to access a certifying physician or a certifying practitioner. So uh, Carla, specific to you and anyone else who may be interested in understanding how they can obtain their, their certification through Canacare Docs, it's as simple as visiting www.canacaredocs.com and across the top header, you're gonna book your appointment. It's, it's really that easy. And you're gonna go right into the telemedicine site, select a day and a time that works best for you. Um, for Massachusetts, we do have a, a very uh, pretty expansive prep team that will phone you ahead of time to help collect your medical documentation. Uh, you will receive notices about what to expect in the in the next steps and, and really just really be the most prepared you can be for the day of your appointment. So that way, uh, the day of your appointment, really your time is just focused on speaking with the practitioner um, and about achieving your healthcare goals through cannabinoid therapies. So again, let us do the heavy lifting for you. Um, really, it's a matter of being able to speak openly and honestly with the practitioner about what you're hoping to achieve through the use of cannabis and why you're looking to achieve a cannabis certification. So again, canacaredocs.com, uh, walk through the steps to go ahead and book your appointment. Um, we've expanded our provider base to ensure that because of the fact that uh, people are our home and, and really not looking to, to leave their home. We've expanded our practitioner base to ensure that we can offer ample appointments um, and really have enough enough time for you to select something that's convenient for you. So uh, Carla, I hope that answers your questions. If not, visit our website. We'll be happy to, to connect with you or you can even message us here uh, on Facebook and we're happy to address those questions. Um, 
Alicia, any, any other research related topics, anything else that perhaps in our conversations you might have that might have sparked some further thought or conversation? Nothing off the top of my head. I know I've got statistics on statistics that I could continue <laughs> continue rhyming off that are probably better uh, better put on our website. I know if you are interested in seeing more results from the actual survey, if you participated, you want to see what anybody else um, what anybody else answered. Obviously, not individual responses. Everything was anonymous, but there is a live dashboard on our website. Um, that you can go to and you can see what other people have responded. You can see more information about um, the impact of COVID-19 um, on cannabis use. One thing that we did find, it wasn't a massive percentage, but there were more individuals seeking medical cannabis as a direct result of the pandemic. I think that what happened earlier on is that a lot of recreational dispensaries weren't able to continue operating. And a lot of patients then who may have been treating medical or medical conditions with recreational cannabis decided now is a good opportunity to go and actually seek medical oversight for their use of cannabis and get that medical certification so that they could continue to access cannabis during the pandemic when they couldn't access it through the recreational markets, which was quite interesting. That's an absolutely great point. And, and that's absolutely true. Many people found themselves without access because when the recreational market had opened in Massachusetts, um, some previously medical cannabis patients felt that there was no longer a need to continue to hold a medical cannabis certification and then suddenly found themselves without access to cannabis at a time where perhaps they, they might have needed it the most. So uh, certainly a lot of benefits that, um, that go along with with being a medical cannabis patient in the state of Massachusetts, we're happy to populate those. Um, but again, being able to reap the benefits of having a provider that can work with you directly, a provider that can help you understand how to best achieve your healthcare goals, working with our organization, our staff, who are experts in cannabis as medicine. They're able to work with you to help you understand the science of cannabis, specific ingestion methods, types of strains, various aspects of, of cannabis as, as medicine itself. Um, as opposed to having to go online and Google all of this information, let us help you, help guide you through this process. So Alicia, great point that you you bring up. Um, as we look forward, I, I know many, many of you have received uh, communications with respect to the Skylight Health complimentary membership as a, as a benefit of being a current Canacare Docs patient, you actually have access to virtual urgent and primary care through the Skylight Health Group. Of course, the Skylight Health Group is another uh, pillar of the CB2 Insights company. So working in conjunction with Canacare Docs, um, it allows our practitioners to collaborate with primary your primary care physician through Skylight Health, um, have greater conversations and more collaborative efforts towards helping you achieve your healthcare goals. So you can actually uh, reach that website just for more information, www.skylight.health forward slash complimentary membership. I'm sure Katie in the background will go ahead and populate that. So it's a great new initiative for existing members of Canacare Docs, uh, for existing patients, excuse me, of Canacare Docs. If you're not a Canacare Docs patient and you've just tuned in out of curiosity uh, for this particular topic, uh, skylight.health, visit that website and read on about the offering that um, Skylight Health has with respect to virtual access to primary and urgent care. And again, in, in light of COVID, um, many people prefer to stay home. They prefer the safety, the comfort of their own home. And with numbers starting to tick up in in some areas, um, the future is is a little bit unknown, and certainly reason to be cautious and and practice the utmost safety where, um, you know, the, the the pandemic is concerned. Whether it be again to the earlier points of Maggie wearing your mask, washing your hand, ensuring that your social distancing, uh, having your appointments through telehealth, all of these different aspects continue to ensure that you're you're presenting the best opportunity to avoid uh, any any of the pandemic. So uh, Maggie, any further thoughts before we close off today? I apologize, I know we're running a bit shorter than the hour expected, but I think we had some technical difficulties with, with Nicole and we'll go ahead and give her the opportunity after the fact 
to perhaps uh, do a small video that we can embed into our comment section as well for um, those of you who wanted to hear what she had to say. So Maggie, anything else that you wanted to share? Yeah, definitely. So I, I read a lot of the research that was available about COVID-19 and cannabis. And they're really, as I always find, there really isn't enough research. And this really is a very important topic right now as, you know, COVID-19 unfortunately is here to stay with us. And we do need to find all of the best strategies and ways to help ourselves as a society while we're facing this. Um, now more than ever, research is really vital with cannabis when medicine is concerned. There is a large amount of the population that is using cannabis for medical purposes. And for us not having enough information about all of those people and how they're treating themselves really is doing us a disservice as a society. Um, we've made a lot of progress with medical cannabis and its acceptance into mainstream medicine. However, there is much more that needs to be done. So I would encourage people to stay involved in the legislative process and with their representative because there still is progress that is needed in medical cannabis. And I know we've come a long way. So some people might think that we've done all that we need to do and they might not be contacting their representatives as much as they were prior to the legalization of medical cannabis. But it really is very important that we're able to do the research that's needed on cannabis. So I hope that people use this opportunity and they have a little bit more time at home to really reach out and talk to the representatives and the people in the health department to really push them that we do need to know more about cannabis as a medicine. That's absolutely right. And thank you for sharing that, Maggie. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Maggie has, a, has had a lot of experience and at the legislative level working with uh, various members of, of government to really drive the messaging surrounding cannabis as medicine. So Maggie, thank you very much. You've certainly left your footprint in the industry and have done wonderful things to further uh, the benefits uh, for medical cannabis patients. So thank you very much. A huge thank you to you. We're very lucky to have you on our team as well. My pleasure. So, I want to take a moment to just kind of summarize again. Um, our mission today was to not make medical claims. Obviously, we we very much believe in cannabis as medicine. We interact with patients on a daily basis. We hear a lot of wonderful stories of how cannabis benefits various patients for various ailments. We really believe those stories. We really believe that patients truly are benefiting from cannabis as a therapy. We do. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing what we do if we didn't truly believe it. However, to Maggie's point, to Alicia's point, research needs to be furthered. Research needs to be had. It's very important to be able to take deeper dives into cannabis as a medicine and really help understand or help be able to deliver a message of how cannabis can help with not only perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic, but many of the day-to-day -day ailments that perhaps you are sitting at home are experiencing, uh, whether it be anxiety, chronic pain, PTSD, COVID-19. Again, research is definitely needed. We have brought to you today our best information as it relates to the existing paper that is out there, uh, the best information as it relates to our own understanding of, of cannabis as medicine. And we certainly hope if nothing else, it has really prompted some thought um, about what the potential of cannabis as a medicine could be. So we thank you very much for, for listening in today. As always, as we close the show, I just want to go through some thank yous. Nicole Dennis, unfortunately, wasn't able to stay on with us for the entire show. Um, and we apologize again for her technical difficulties. I know that she was very much looking forward to sharing information um, about, about this from her perspective as a nurse practitioner. So again, we'll circle back with her and see if she can put together something that we can add to the comments section. Melissa Martell, uh, who's the video that you saw was brought to you by Melissa Martell, who is a nurse practitioner in our Maine, uh, our state of Maine, excuse me. Melissa is a certifying nurse practitioner as well as a practitioner for our Skylight Health Group. So thank you, Melissa, for your video contribution there. 
Alicia, thank you so much. We appreciate all the time that you take to really just comb through um, tons and tons and tons of data and, and really compiling it in a way that tells a story or provokes thought. So thank you so much for what you do. Um, I know I enjoy going to the CB2 Insights website to look at the data and really see how it's changing. Um, I find it very interesting. And again, if you're sitting at home, take a peek at www.cb2insights.com. You yourself can actually look at the dashboards that are there available. They are updated periodically. Um, so we encourage you to do that. So Alicia, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I think I'm just gonna mention as well too, sure. coming down the road, we may have more surveys coming up because cannabis research is obviously so necessary. As Maggie mentioned, it's also very difficult to do just based on regulations by the FDA. So one of the ways that we can gain more information is actually reaching out to our patients and having you tell us how your experience has been. That information to put it out into the medical field, into just the academic knowledge surrounding medical cannabis is so important. So I strongly encourage for any patients who are watching, if you are contacted in the future about doing a survey, your input on those surveys is so important to progressing the future of medical cannabis. And anybody who has already participated in this survey, thank you very much. It's it's so important and it can make a huge difference as much as that five minutes may not seem like a lot to you, it can do a lot in the long run. Thank you for sharing that, Alicia. It's absolutely true. And again, just as a reminder, those surveys are anonymous. So your information is, is aggregated and kept, it's an aggregated and anonymized. So you should have no fears or worries about um, your information being improperly shared. So it, it's important for you to know that. Maggie, thank you so much. As always, Maggie, you are just a wealth of information. Um, your presentation today, we certainly hope that um, People found your information very valuable. Um, Maggie's always available. If you if you head into our Canicure Docs group, if you're not a member of that group, by all means, go into the, the Canicure Docs page and you can actually join the Canicure Docs group. Katie, if you don't mind, just directing people to that in the comments. Um, Maggie is in that group as well and, and is happy to answer questions as, as they're, they're populated. So um, in fact, all of our management team, many of our staff, our practitioners are all in this group as well. Other patients are in this group. Um, so it's just a really interesting place for you to go in and just chat with like-minded people or, or even professionals who you might be seeking some answers. So Maggie, thank you very much for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, anytime, anytime. Uh, of course, thank you to Canicare Docs, of course, course, which is brought to you by Skylight Health, uh, the website, canicaredocs.com. And of course, again, Hannah Care Docs patients have a complimentary membership to the Skylight Health um, Virtual Primary and Urgent Care. So check that out. Katie will populate that if she hasn't already. I think she has. Um, oh, Cindy, thank you very much. Hi, Cindy. Um, thank you for tuning in today. We appreciate your support as always. Um, thank you to Relax Clarity. Relax Clarity is our West Coast certification um, organization. Relax Clarity, of course, at relaxclarity.com. So those of you who might be watching from the West Coast, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate that you took the time. Of course, our parent company, CB2 Insights, just such amazing things. If, if you think that cannabis certifications is just what we're all about, there's just so much more as clearly indicated by um, Alicia's um, input today. But CB2 Insights is just really looking at all different kinds of, of ways to help patients achieve healthcare goals. And of course, through its newest initiative, Skylight Health. So we encourage you to visit that website as well. Eric B, Eric B Media, of course, thank you very much for this amazing studio and the opportunity to be able to allow people joining us from internationally even to come together and really bring this information to you today. So visit him at www.ericbmedia.com. Of course, Jean St. Pierre, who again, I keep promising someday will join me on the air. I, I've, I've yet to be able to get him, uh, get him into the studio. So hopefully we'll be able to bring him to you very soon. And of course, all of these these comments here that um, that you've been reading here and are able to reference back, all brought to you by Katie in the background. So Katie, thank you very much. We appreciate that you join us every noontime on Tuesday to make this all possible. And 
Lastly, and certainly most importantly, thank you to you, our viewers. Thank you very much if you're an existing patient. Thank you if you're considering becoming a patient. We hope that you've, we've brought you information today, which will again, provoke some thought on your part or perhaps guide you into how you yourself uh, can become a medical cannabis patient. So again, thank you very much. We really appreciate your tuning in. Thank you all for, for joining me here today. And we hope that you stay safe and have an absolutely great day. Uh, we will see you a week from next Tuesday. Uh, we are off next week, but we'll be joining you back the week after. So thank you all very much. Have a great day. Take care.